Okay, so um, what I'll focus on today is variational quantum eigen solvers. So this morning you heard about um, this class of uh, algorithms that we envision solving on more near-term quantum computers. And I'll specifically narrow down and focus on the choice of ansatz, what constitutes a good ansatz and how we find one. And then I'll um, kind of answer that question with our work on adaptive problem tailored ansatz. And also uh, based on some discussion yesterday, I also included this last um, topic here, which is going beyond digitized gates and thinking about control impulses directly for um, quantum information tasks, quantum computing. Okay, so again, because uh, this morning you heard about um, quite a bit about this, I'll give more of a summary of the problem. So the type of problem we're interested in is simulating many body dynamics. And kind of the most basic thing you could do in that space is find the ground state energy of a many body system. So the Hamiltonian I've written here is for uh, electrons in interacting with uh, nuclei and with each other through Coulomb interactions. And this problem is hard to solve. Uh, the space uh, grows exponentially. So it's something that's computationally hard to solve for classical computers. Um, it's common in this community to work in second quantization. So what this means is that we have chosen a basis and we write down uh, creation annihilation operators, fermionic creation annihilation operators in that particular basis. And the coefficients here are um, integrals that we have um, calculated pre-computed classically. So this Hamiltonian is given to us where these choices have been made up front. And there's also, of course, a, a choice as to how many orbitals to keep to describe the system. And of course, if you keep more orbitals, your computation is more um, accurate. Okay, so one thing to note about this kind of Hamiltonian is that the type of operators appearing here are fermionic operators, which means that they obey uh, these anti, um, I'm sorry, these anti commutation relations. Um, so when we transform from a Hamiltonian like this into qubits, we need to worry about the fact that um, the operators have to uh, follow this relation. All right, so what uh, we can do for that is we can encode um, into the mapping we do from this fermionic system into our qubits, we can encode this uh, anti-symmetrization um, feature of the wave function, or in other words, the, the anti-commutation relation of the fermionic operators. And we do this in the following way. First, th there's many ways to do this. I'll be exclusively talking about the jordan Wigner mapping. And this is perhaps the most intuitive mapping uh, out of all the ones that exist, because it kind of follows this uh, binary sense that um, uh, fermionic orbitals have, spin orbitals, and qubits have. So a spin orbital, because of... Um, Recording uh, stopped. Recording in progress. Because of the Pauli exclusion principle, <clears throat> a spin orbital can be either occupied or unoccupied. So you cannot put two fermions in the same spin orbital. Um, and the fact that this has this binary kind of sense is also reflected in a qubit where a qubit can be state zero or one. So it's kind of an intuitive thing to map um, the occupation of an orbital into uh, the state of a qubit. But then we have to worry about these um, anti-commutation relations and the fact that if we switch two of these fermionic operators, we get a minus sign. And the way we encode this uh, under this jordan Wigner mapping is to, uh, in the ordering of the qubits, so the qubits have some ordering that follow the ordering we decided for our uh, spin orbitals. We can uh, include Z operators, which are uh, have an index that's smaller than the um, orbital we're raising or lowering. And by doing that, we pick up minus signs if that orbital is occupied. So that exactly mimics um, the raising lowering operators uh, or equation relation operators of Fermi. Okay, so once we do that, we have a Hamiltonian. Um, the integrals have been pre-computed. 
uh, we've done the mapping into um, into qubit space. So we have a Hamiltonian that's given to us in terms of Pauli strings with some weight in front of each. And then the objective, at least the simplest objective we want, is to use the quantum computer to prepare a state and measure the state in there. And then uh, base our, uh, our procedure on the variational principle of quantum mechanics, which tells us that um, the mean energy of a, of a system is bounded by below from the real ground state. So that means that if we can keep minimum, uh, lowering, lowering the energy, uh, ideally when we hit a minimum, in the ideal case, we will have found the ground state. Of course, that's not always um, the case. It depends a lot on how you run your procedure, but uh, that's kind of the ob objective here. Um, so this algorithm is being envisioned more for uh, near-term quantum computers where we don't have all the machinery of quantum error correction. Um, so we don't have long coherence times. So we can trade off measurements for coherence times. And the objective function here, what we're trying to minimize is this uh, mean value here. So uh, H is the Hamiltonian and uh, C some wave function that we have parameterized according to some parameters uh, theta, which I write here in a vector form. Okay, so um, what this objective function depends on, so here I've, I used A to, to um, just consider more general operators on the Hamiltonian, but for now we'll be focusing on the Hamiltonian exclusively. So what uh, this objective function depends on is of course the obse observable to be measured, in our case the Hamiltonian, and it's also uh, dependent on the ansatz. So the ansatz is this uh, state C of theta, which we create using some parameterized quantum circuits. So we're assuming all our qubits as a standard start from zero. And then we uh, apply some operators uh, that have parameters in them, which is what we will tune in order to minimize this quantity. And we'll do this, of course, with the help of a classical computer, which will allow us to do optimization. And the answer is pretty much what I want to focus on on this talk. And I want to start by reviewing uh, types of ansatz that have been considered by the community. So one ansatz is uh, what people call the hardware efficient ansatz. So this is created by um, alternating single qubit gates. And these are the ones that carry the parameters in them, as you can see over here. Uh, with uh, some entangling gates in the screen box. And then you layer this uh, circuit by just repeating this uh, elementary built-in blocks of it. <clears throat> so what's nice about the sunset is that it kind of takes advantage of what the hardware can not naturally do. So it uses, um, it uses gates that are native and in that way it can kind of exploit the system as much as possible and hopefully gonna maximize, uh, get as much as possible out of the coherence time. On the other hand, this is a really ad hoc ansatz. Nothing tells you that this is the ideal ansatz for the given problem you're trying to solve. And it might be very inefficient because you kind of don't know how much to sample, where to end over here. And even when you stop um, layering these units, you don't, there's no guarantee that you included the ground state in there. And uh, perhaps an even bigger problem is that this is a difficult to optimize ansatz. So there's been a lot of work starting with this uh, work from Jared McLean, um, where people have shown that uh, these type of ansatz uh, create uh, landscapes um, that have barren plateaus, which means that um, the gradients, when we're trying to optimize the parameters, um, are, are really, really flat and um, go exponentially to zero as the system size uh, grows. The other ansatz that people consider um, have considered a lot in the literature, I would say maybe the predominant one, has been the unitary coupled cluster. So Brigitte talked about this in the morning, but just to remind you, so uh, this is a unitary operator that you create by taking um, expon exponentials, sum of exponentials of these fermionic uh, uh, operators. So here you have a dagger A, and then you have doubles, which is a dagger, a dagger, a, a. 
And you can parameterize each of these separately and then optimize those parameters. So one issue is that, of course, in NISC, uh, the trotter order will be very low. So this is a, the exponential of a very large sum of terms. So to make this into gates that uh, um, can be run on a quantum computer, you need to do um, to break it up and do trotterization. So one problem is that uh, in NISC, we have to stop at low order interpretation because we don't have that much coherence time. Um, but that's a problem because um, depending on the order in which to pick the ordering of the operators, you can get wildly different answers. And in fact, we've shown that you can get qualitatively different results depending on how you order these operators. You can get good solutions to your chemistry problem, which is what we studied here, or you can get um, solutions that don't converge. Um, so in addition to that, you get very long circuits. So compared to here, where you can kind of stop when you feel like, and maybe layer it a bit more. In this, uh, for this ANSATS UCC, uh, you get a very long circuit. But I think from kind of our point of view, what's, um, what was not satisfactory about either of these, uh, type of ansatz is that neither know anything about the problem you're trying to solve. And given that we're trying to squeeze as much as we can out of quantum processors and given their limitations at this point, the more you can tailor your problem, your, your algorithm to the problem you're trying to solve, uh, presumably the more you're going to benefit from it and uh, get more out of it. All right, so these are the properties we would like out of a good ansatz. So we have some reference state. We're applying a unitary operator that's parameterized. And what we want out of the ansatz we get out is that um, it's not created using too long a circuit. So we don't want this T of theta to lead to deep circuits. And that's because, of course, coherence is very limited. The optimization itself is not infinitely powerful, so we don't have, want to have too many optimization parameters. And we would like, of course, to be able to span the space where the solution lives, because if we're searching in one corner of the Hilbert space and the solution lives in a totally different corner, then we're not going to find that solution, of course. All right, so this is just uh, repeating what I said. And the idea we're going to explore is to use the quantum computer to help us create the answer. Um, and the algorithm that uh, we have introduced and does that is called ADAPT. Um, ADAPT VQE, and ADAPT stands now for Adaptive Problem Tailored VQE. And this is a dynamically created ANSAT. So we're going to be um, running circuits on the quantum computer, making measurements. And as we do that, we're going to be growing, growing the ANSAT. So we start from something uh, simple, uh, like some short depth ANSATs. And in fact, we uh, start from the Hartree Fock, which is a mean field solution. And then we use uh, measurements to grow it further. So I'll um, kind of introduce the elements that this algorithm uses. So the first element is a pool of operators. So you have to tell um, this algorithm, what are the building blocks? And these are gonna be gates that are either physically motivated, are native on the hardware or some combination of both ideally. So this is a set of operators that are available to us, which we can exponentiate to create unitary operators here. Um, a is anti-hermitian. So this is a unitary matrix. So this is an input to the algorithm. The next thing is to tell the algorithm, how are you going to grow the ansatz? What is your criterion for which out of all these operators to choose? So um, the criterion uh, we have proposed and that has worked very well in all our tests is to take the gradient with respect to a trial operator that you're adding over here, evaluate that at uh, theta equals zero, and that gives you a commutator of uh, the Hamiltonian with this candidate uh, operator. <clears throat> so now this object over here is a new Hermitian operator, so you can view that like some new Hamiltonian, which you can also measure on the hardware. So you can, in fact, parallelize the step and measure all the operators that are available to you. And then the one that maximizes this gradient, uh, this gradient is the one that you can choose to add. 
Um, all right, so here's kind of a flow chart of how this works. So this is our uh, operator pool. Uh, we have the step where we measure the gradients. As I mentioned, this can be parallelized on different quantum computers. And if all these gradients give zero, then you're done. In reality, of course, um, we're not going to get exactly zero, so we can set a threshold. <clears throat> and if our gradients or the vector of gradients is smaller than that threshold, then we can stop. If not, we select the operator that has the largest gradient. We append it onto the um, state, uh, onto the circuit. And then we re-optimize all the parameters we have up to that point. And then we just repeat. So we, um, th we don't disturb the pool. What I mean by that is that once we use an operator, it's still available to be used later. And then we continue this way. And then we pick the operator. The next operator has the largest gradient, and we keep going this way. OK, so let me show you some uh, classical simulations we did on this. Um, so here uh, on the top, you can see three different molecules we are um, we're simulating. This is lithium hydride, beryllium hydride, and this is hydrogen 6. Um, and here we're comparing different uh, ansatz. So the green is quite irrelevant. It's a hard tree fog. We don't expect it to do well. All the other ones kind of look like they fall into each other. So these include the ADAPT algorithm for different thresholds of the gradient, as, a, as well as the UCCSD, this um, ansatz I showed you in, the, in a few slides ago. So because here uh, this, in the scale you cannot distinguish things, I'm going to plot, uh, I'm going to show you here a plot of uh, the difference from the exact energy plot in a logarithmic scale as a function of the distance between uh, the atoms over here. So the orange one is this uh, previously used ansatz, um, the uh, UCC, UCCSD specifically. And you see ADAPT has naturally this threshold, so you can have different orders of ADAPT. And the tighter you make the threshold, um, that uh, helps you go uh, closer to the uh, exact energy. Um, so you see here that ADAPT, as you increase the threshold, does better than uh, UCCSD. And what's uh, even more interesting is that it does so using fewer resources in terms of um, number of operators. So what we have in the y-axis over here is the number of parameters that appear in the ansatz, which in this case is the same as the number of operators because it's the same operators that enter UCCSD and that um, we use in this implementation of ADAPT. And you can see here that uh, ADAPT needs um, a fraction of the, of the operators that the UCCSD needs. In one case, it needs more, but th that actually happens to be a case where UCCSD does not do well. So this shaded area is what uh, Brigitte mentioned in the morning that's called chemical accuracy, which means basically that if you're within the shaded area, you're um, satisfied. OK, so now you can kind of, um, we can go back here and argue about UCCSD and why it didn't do so well. And recall that UCCSD has a sum of single and double fermionic operators. So you go up to A dagger, A dagger, AA. Whereas ADAPT is kind of a, you can view it like a pseudo trotter version of that. And you could argue that the reason it does better is because of that, because I have now separated out the operators into products. So to, to show you that that's not the case, um, what I'm showing here is comparing uh, the ADAPT VQE algorithm. So again, we're showing as a, um, the energy as a function of the number of parameters. And we're comparing to just doing random orderings. And you see that if you do random orderings of these same operators, um, you converge much slower compared to this algorithm that knows something about the problem and gets feedback from the quantum computer. So this is a particular molecule at a particular bond distance, but we've done many similar calculations and we consistently get this, this result. OK, so, so far, um, I have used the fermionic pool. So this is the same pool that enters at UCCSD. And it's, it's, it's quite a fair comparison to UCCSD for that reason. But the algorithm is much broader than that. You can actually use any pool you like in principle. 
So here we're exploring what happens if I change the pool to something that's more hardware friendly. Uh, if you recall, um, the fermionic operators, when we mapped them into qubits, they had these long Z strings. And as a result, they led to multi-qubit gates. So what we can do instead is just drop, the simplest thing we do is drop these Z strings and create the operators that enter our pool, which are just um, products of up to four polys. So this is a much simpler uh, thing to do on the hardware. And we expect that the circuits will get our shallower this way. And we do two comparisons. So now we compare within ADAPT, we compare the fermionic pool to this qubit pool. Um, so in the top plot, you see um, how the energy uh, changes, how it converges to the exact energy as a function of the iteration number. So as I'm adding operators, and the fermionic one converges faster. That's, that's the red one. Um, so that, though, is not the whole story because the number of operators and equivalently the number of parameters doesn't really tell us the number of gates because the fermionic um, operator is uh, mapped into a large number of gates on the qubit space. So we actually need to do that. And what we look at here is the number of C naughts that each of these pools needs in order to converge. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, then you see that not surprisingly, this more um, hardware uh, kind of friendly pool converges faster than the fermionic version. And I should say that here, we didn't try to optimize the pool or anything like that. This was just kind of a very simple uh, chopping these strings and com comparing. There's been works by other groups where they've shown how you can do even better uh, if you modify the pool further. Okay, so we tried different pools and other groups have tried other pools as well, but there's still the outstanding question of how should we choose the operator pool? What, what is a good pool? Um, and one, of course, that you can choose it according to hardware constraints, but how do we guarantee that that pool allow us, allows us to go to the ground state? So we have introduced the concept of complete pools and what com a complete pool is, is it's a pool that if I take products um, of exponentiated operators with different parameters, it allows me to reach any real state if I start from any other real state. And the reason we restrict ourselves to real states is because we're considering problems that have time reversal symmetry, so all the coefficients are real. And that's a very relevant thing to do uh, in chemistry and uh, many uh, condensed matter systems model. Okay, so um, the, the completeness criteria is the following. Um, I can create uh, the algebra out of the, all, all the pool operators by taking commutators. And then if I can get a complete basis by acting on an arbitrary state uh, with this algebra, then uh, that pool is complete. So that suffices to take me to any real state. And we've done some numerical tests to demonstrate this. So we took random Hamiltonians of three, four, and five qubits. And we indeed showed that if you have complete pools according to this criterion, you converge to the ground state. If you don't, uh, oftentimes you get stuck. So that's the blue versus the red. Um, but of, of great interest here is how small can these pools be? Because if you remember, there's a step in the algorithm where we have to, at every, at every iteration, we have to measure all the gradients of all possible pool operators. So very large pools um, would be uh, bad for the algorithm because it would make the scaling worse. And in fact, what we have shown is that the minimal size of complete pools is linear in the number of qubits. So I'm gonna try to walk you through some of the results we have on this. So here's an example of a minimal complete pool. And you can see a nice feature of this is that it's also a nearest neighbor pool. So it has um, non-trivial polys on two neighboring qubits. So um, it should be a, a nice pool to use on hardware. So th this uh, satisfies the, uh, the criterion for completeness and it has uh, a size to n minus two. Um, so 
the way we uh, prove that uh, this proof is, the, sorry, this pool is complete. We start by defining an alternate pool that's a little bit easier to work with, uh, but taking products of this uh, original pool. And then we prove that any three qubit real state can be transformed to zero, zero, zero. And then of course, if you can transform any real state to the state, you can go from any real state to any other real state. And we have an inductive proof. So first we prove it for three qubits uh, and I'll show you, uh, I'll, I'll sketch the proof. So um, these are the pool operators and you see there's uh, Y rotations on uh, two of the qubits and then conditional rotation on one of the qubit, uh, sorry, two, two of the other of the qubits, one of them is in both. And basically what we do is we start from an arbitrary three qubit state and we show that we can do a rotation to bring it to an equal superposition uh, of these two states as shown here. Um, and then we can do conditional rotations to bring the state um, in this form where now all these um, uh, states of the rightmost qubits have the same weight, uh, the same vector, so, sorry, the, the, the same length. And then we can continue doing uh, conditional rotations in a way that we uh, kind of disentangle qubits and rotate uh, the remaining qubits into the same state so that we can continue using um, conditional rotations and we can gradually rotate um, the state into the zero, zero, zero. So um, this, this kind of shows you which operators are used at every step. And it also shows that they're all coming from this pool. And then the inductive pool works by um, taking an n qubit pool defined uh, in this way iteratively where you multiply by Z the previous pool and add two Y operators. And then if you assume that the, the, this pool is complete, uh, you can prove that uh, uh, V N plus one is complete. And the, the proof is really similar to what I showed you in the previous, <clears throat> in the previous page. Okay, so, so far what we've shown is that there exist complete pools that have size to N minus two, and that we have explicit examples of such pools. And one of them is the nearest neighbor pool. So it should be, uh, you know, uh, good for hardware. One thing that we have not shown is if we can have even smaller pools that are complete. Um, so the answer is no, actually. And I'm going to try to sketch uh, the proof over here. So one element is that we need to have operators that have an odd number of, uh, of uh, Y polys because we have to be able to transform between arbitrary real states. We also need to be able to flip all possible combinations of qubits. So once we generate algebra, we should be able to uh, have all two to the n combina such combinations. So this, these are some examples. Um, so we're going to be working with a product group instead of working with algebra. And the reason is that it's, a little bit, it's easier to work with a product group and also um, the algebra is contained within the product group because um, if, if uh, a commutator doesn't vanish, then it's essentially the same as the product. So um, we can start by uh, generating all possible flippings uh, with uh, uh, product group generators. So we have all the possible Ys here. And now we also have Zs. And the reason we want Zs is because we need to create odd uh, Y poly operators. So we use the Z's such that, let's say I take the product of Y1 and Y2, um, that's gonna be an even poly. So then I can use Z1 uh, to, to create an X and get an odd poly. So if you, uh, if you do that, then you see that you need at least N minus two Z's in this uh, uh, set of generators, such that you can create all the odd uh, Y flippings. So this means that I cannot have um, any, any uh, smaller size pool, <clears throat> I'm sorry, any, any smaller size um, uh, generator group. So this generator set can give me a pool by taking uh, products that give me odd values. And the reason uh, I can work with a, a product group and bound um, the, the algebra is because if I have um, two odd operators, 
that uh, don't commute. So if they don't commute, they com if they don't commute, they anti-commute. Um, then the product is the same as the as the um, commutator. So then I know that the algebra uh, is contained in the product group, and if I bound the one, then I, I if I bound the product group, I can bound the algebra. Okay. Another question is now given I have a two n minus two pool of odd operators. How do I know it's complete? And we have some criteria, and the most efficient criterion is the second one. And actually, there's also an open mathematical problem here. Um, so the criterion is that the pool of uh, these um, odd uh, y operators cannot be split into two mutually commuting sets. So we have shown that this is a necessary condition, but we have not shown that it's sufficient. We do use it though in practice. We've done exhaustive numerical searches, and we've shown that it has to be sufficient. And it's actually um, uh, this scales well as a criterion. So you don't want to have to generate a full algebra and check uh, because that doesn't doesn't uh, scale well with n. Whereas uh, this one scales by mapping it on onto a graph problem. Okay, so I think I don't have a whole lot of time left, so I'm going to go a little bit uh, more quickly through this. But um, one thing that I have not talked about so far, so I've talked about um, what completeness means, and that if I have a complete uh, pool, then I can reach any real state. But I have not um, argued that ADAPT can find that path, right? So ADAPT might have all the pools it needs um, all the operators it needs in its pool, but it might not be able to actually find the path it needs. And the reason this happens uh, is that it can get stuck because of symmetries. So in addition to making sure that your pool is uh, complete, equally or even more importantly, is to uh, make sure that the symmetries are satisfied. So one example is that um, if we don't respect symmetries, then the gradient criterion might not allow us to even start. So a simple example of that is consider a Pauli operator that changes the number of particles. When I take this commutator, I'm going to end up with this. So because the Hamiltonian conserves the number of particles, then this matrix element will each be zero, and the gradient will be identically zero, so I will never be able to start. And similarly for other types of symmetries. And there is Symmetries I also have to worry about um, that could get me kind of uh, stuck. So if we address this and incorporate uh, the symmetries of the Hamiltonian, then um, I'm going to go a little bit faster than this, just show you the, the conclusion. We can actually find pools that have a smaller number, uh, even smaller than the 2n minus 2 that we know we need for arbitrary states, because now we're only searching within a symmetry subspace. So in this example, uh, the minimal complete pool has 14 operators, uh, shown in red, but the green one has fewer operators, and you see it converges much more successfully. All right, and then the last thing I want to show you about the adapt wiki algorithm before I uh, go to basically my last two slides is um, the issue of trainability. So this is something the wiki community has worried about a lot. Um, you know, finding Ansatze that have landscapes that can be um, optimized. And I, I alluded a little bit to this barn plateau problem before. So we have, uh, 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 we, we have evidence that ADAPT converges before barn plateau is set in. Um, and that means that we have a shallow circuit. And one issue the community has raised and is worried about is that if your circuit is too um, shallow and not expressive enough, the landscape is too rugged. So you can worry about trainability issues. And I'll show you here that that's not a problem for the ADAPT algorithm. And this is just on an example. We have multiple uh, uh, numerical simulations of, of, of similar uh, behavior. So let me just walk you through this. So the red, um, sorry, the green curve shown here is running ADAPT. So as, as I discussed, you're growing the ansatz. So as I'm adding operators, I'm adding parameters. So that's what's shown in the x-axis. If I take a cut for a given parameter, I have some ansatz, which 
you can use the adapt protocol to initialize the parameters according to the optimized value they had before, or you can take that same ansatz and just initialize the parameters randomly and see what is the minimum you can get. And indeed, you see that the landscape is quite bad because if I just do random initializations, the solutions are all over the place. Whereas the interesting thing here is the adapt algorithm doesn't care about that because it knows what parameters to start from when the optimization is happening. So it only follows this path and it doesn't care at all about this landscape um, that you know, uh, exists if you don't initialize correctly. So the point here is that even though the landscape is ugly, it doesn't matter from the point of view of the adapt algorithm. And by the way, here, the blue is the best possible initialization, which is very close to, to what ADAPT does. All right, so um, the last thing I wanted to mention, the reason I added this is that um, at Seth's uh, talk yesterday, there was a little bit of discussion of parameterizing uh, pulses and essentially doing quantum control as opposed to doing uh, digital uh, quantum computing with gates. And I wanted to, to show you what we've done on that. So you can basically run VQE and forget about the gates I showed you in these parameterized gates. And instead of trying to uh, parameterize and optimize those, just go one level down in the hardware and parameterize the pulses directly. So the way gates are created in the lab is of course that you have some electromagnetic um, wave that couples to the qubits and it drives them. And this has some particular shape in time. It has a frequency. So there's all these tunable parameters you can change. So what you can do is you can do VQE by directly modifying the Hamiltonian, the time dependent Hamiltonian. Um, and you can do optimization the same way we've been doing by updating these pulse parameters. So this is just a schematic of that. Um, and I want to uh, show you what we did for transmond. So we took a Hamiltonian that- um... Sorry, Sophia, can I ask you to wrap up within like a couple of minutes oh, or so? Sure, sure. This is my last, okay. my Thanks. last slide. Yeah. Um, so here we took the uh, Hamiltonian that uh, looks a lot like IBM's Hamiltonian from their processors. Um, so this is the static Hamiltonian. Um, and there's uh, some single qubit term and some coupling term. And then you have a drive Hamiltonian, and this is the thing we're going to vary. And then you create an ansatz that's the time ordered um, uh, operator acting on your reference state. And then you create um, uh, this objective function based on that, and you're trying to minimize. So, what you can do is you can start with uh, flat pulses and then just start chopping them randomly, and then modifying, uh, optimizing uh, the amplitude of this pulse and doing that in an iterative way. And we have shown that you can uh, actually get um, the energy to match the exact energy for different molecules that we have simulated. The simulations are much more costly, of course, because now you're simulating the full-time dynamics of the system. And we've shown that you can uh, reach chemical accuracy in a kind of a monotonic fashion. And if we try to make a comparison to what would happen if I compare to gate-based uh, approach, uh, we can take the same unitary that's created here directly by the pulse and compile it back into a UCCSD unitary. And if we do that, we see that there are some orders of magnitude, more than three orders of magnitude difference. So you can do much more within the coherence time of the hardware by using this pulse-based control. All right, so this brings me to my last slide. I apologize if I run a few minutes over. Um, so I uh, discussed quite a bit our work on ADAPT VQE, which is um, an algorithm we introduced to iteratively and dynamically leverage a quantum computer to create an ansatz, which is tailored to the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, I discussed a little bit about uh, minimal complete pools, what kind of operators you should have in your operator pool, showed you that ADAPT does not suffer from turnability issues. And in the very end of the talk, um, briefly went over the pulse-based optimization for VQEs. So I'll just uh, leave the acknowledgements to my group and I'm happy to take questions.